were discussing about samudghat. Samudghat is the a concept where the soul leaves the body in the living state and returns back. And there are different kinds of samudghat which we have discussed earlier. And today we are going to deal with the, or discuss aharak samudghat. Now the word ahar actually means nourishment of food. Ahar in Hindi is actually meaning food. And ahar here actually means receiving. This is a very special kind of uh, samudghat, but before tapping into this, I will have a question for you. How do you define God? Yeah. Because this is a samudghat which is related to Bhagwan. So, how do you define God? So, there's a word we have jina and tirthankar, isn't it? So, how do you define tirthankar? Someone who has attained the maximum capacity. Very good. So, basically, uh, jina or tirthankar are human beings, but they've attained their maximum potentiality of the soul. So, unveil their capacity of enli uh, enlightened state, they've accomplished enlightened state, or in other words, they've accomplished a state of all-knowing uh, state and a state where it's, it's a pure state, no attachment, no aversion, no impurities of emotions, no anger, no greed, no deceit. So that purity and that enlightenment they've accomplished and they are the leaders of the congregation. So they've not only accomplished it, the beauty of this is they're they are ready to share it and guide others on the same path because there could be other, pe other uh, enlightened beings who might um, accomplish it, but they've accomplished it and they, just, they say, okay, I'm done. They're not least bothered about uh, helping others in, especially as establishing a congregation. So we have two kinds of enlightened beings, a general Kevuli and there is Tirthankar or Jina. The big difference actually is uh, that the Jina establishes the congrega uh, congregational uh, opportunity, so which means anyone could get uh, ordained into a congregation as a lay person or a monk and practice it. And a Kevali would actually be enlightened, so at the level of consciousness they're all equal. But they would not make an initiative to go and um, create such a big platform for spiritual uh, purpose for others, basically. And even behind this, the difference actually lies because of the karma theory. There is a specific karma called Nam karma. So someone might have done something great in their previous life to get so much of uh, punya or virtue to have become a tirthankar and they are just uh, going through that process of getting over their spe special chunk of punya basically. Yeah? So it, it's just that. Now when we talk about aharak, why did I bring up that is Aharak Samudgat is a Samudgat in which a person could actually project out to reach to a Tirthankar or a Jina. So we all have different ways of communication, isn't it? There's different kinds of media technology which we use to communicate with the other people in other countries, other places. So simple words like you use phone. In earlier time, how it would be telegram and it would take months to reach to the other place. Now we have instant phone, we have uh, WhatsApp group, WhatsApp technology, we have Facebook, whatnot, right? There are many methods to just reach to the other world within very short duration of time. Now suppose we have to reach to someone like a Tirthankar. Is there any technology which could help us? Any phone uh, call we can do to the Tirthankar and say, okay, I want, I, I need your help and uh, can you help me with this? Prayers. Then, uh -huh. prayers. Prayers. Okay. The reason prayers is one way, of course. Uh, but other than prayers, the reason why we come think about this is because the tirthankar which we are talking about are there in the physical world as human being in other lands. So in Jainism, we believe that this current land doesn't have any uh, tirthankar um, residing here. But there are other lands where there are Tirthankars. So Bhagwan Mahavi was the last Tirthankar here and there were 24 Tirthankars in this land. But there are other lands which is uh, like Mahavide Kshetra. So there are currently 20 Tirthankars residing in that land uh, at the moment. And if you go back to Jain geography, there are some lands which have this cycle, a cyclical time 
So for us, we are in the decline in Kali Yuga time and things are going deteriorating. And for us, we have 24 Tirthankars and no more Tirthankars after that. But in Mahavira Ekshetra, this is not the case. The situations there don't go to like a declining phase, first thing. The second thing is they would always have some or the other Tirthankar residing there. So the presence of the Jina or Tirthankar or Bhagwan is, I mean, always there in these lands. It's called Mahavira. So suppose we don't have a Tirthankar here. Like for example, we might not have an expert here, but if we have some experts in India, what do we say? Let's get it done from India. Yeah? Quickly we say, let's, they'll help us or they'll do it and it'll be cheaper there. <laughs> That's another problem, <laughs> another thing. But here it's not about cheap cheap thing. It's, it's about, we don't have the Tirthankar here. We have the Tirthankar there and can we reach there? Abhi tak to koi air, airplane nahi bani hai jo wahan jati hai. Do you find any, any flight taking us to Mahavira Kshetra? So there we have different other methods of communication. And the other methods of communication, as Bansi said, prayer is the one quick method which you could think of. But in prayer, you are saying the prayer, but one is receiving the prayer. Do you have any doubt about it? No. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a possibility that Bhagavan is not listening to your prayer? Can you imagine? Prayer is not listening to your prayer. Prayer to prayer and how it goes. See, Bhagavan is an enlightened being. So there is no doubt about whether he, he knows everything in a way. So there isn't that there is no receiving end or the receiving end is uh, messed up. Sometimes it happens, right? The phone, you make some phone calls and the other person who is there on the other end, their phone is not working because Wi-Fi is not good there and all that stuff. Especially in India, when we do the phone calls, it's a big uh, distracting uh, phone call. Why? Because there is a big problem in the receiving end. But here it's a cavely. So no issues with uh, the other end of the communication. The only uh, uh, vacuum here is that you're saying he's receiving, but there is no other way around. Communication happens when I say something, you receive it, and then you say that you respond to it, and then I receive it. So it's just one way traffic happening, the, the other way is not beyond that. It's beyond our capacity, why? Right? Because we cannot re understand or receive what Bhagwan is trying to say to us from there. There are other methods in which uh, we can still have a communication. So for example, there are one method which is uh, a mediator. So there is a theory that if any devta is your friend and through the devta you can actually send the message and the devta has the capacity to reach to Mahavide and receive the message and then get back the answer to you. And in history we have had this kind of situation. So for example there is some kind of philosophical uh, issue or concern or uh, some debate. So for, And uh, there are two monks who said one says this is true and the other says no, no, this is not the right understanding of the text, yeah, it's different. And in that context, what do you do? Because both are intellectually very smart uh, monks, uh, they're experts, they're learned, they've learned all the scriptures. Both have equal voice in mentioning their view. So there, there could be a possibility that if you have the capacity to invo invoke a devta, bring them, invite them, ask the question to them and they go on your behalf to Bhagwan Mahavidya, I mean, uh, to Simandar Swami or Mahavidya Kshetra, get the answer and then you receive it. So there is a mediator through mediation, there could be a possibility of getting an answer. There is a third possibility. The third possibility is, you say, why do I need to ask the mediator to get the answer? Why can't the mediator take me there? Right? Sometimes you say, I need to see the product or I need to uh, check uh, which is a marriage hair. So you want to see the wedding place and stuff rather than just parents seeing it. Or you want to get convinced about the things in, in more detail. So here, th even this is another possibility. And in history this has happened. Uh, you're familiar with Stuli Bhadra, some of you, right? So Stuli Bhadra uh, had a brother, Shriya. And of course, uh, his sister was Yaksha Sati. 
tree was a monk and he wasn't able to f do like intense fasting and as a sister nun she would say why don't you try why don't you try you know like it's solution it's somewhat sorry you should do fasting so she motivated and finally he ma made an attempt to do upvas but on the same day he passed off and that was very um, troublesome for the sadhvi the sister nun she said oh because i asked him to do fasting and he 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 died is it like i am the cause of his death and she took it to her heart the whole congregation said well i mean your intention was just to motivate him to fast and he did the fasting so what a big deal it's 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 not you you were not the person who uh, is, should be blamed of it she said no uh, i don't get convinced about it she said finally that if simander swami tells me that i am not the culprit or i'm really not to to be blamed for this then i will get convinced that yes i'm I, it was not my fault the congregation said well she's not uh, getting uh, satisfied with this so what do we do and there the congregation decides that we will actually make her reach to the uh, simander song now how do they do it the whole congregation does a special meditation kayatsa and a special meditation of kayatsa when they do it the devta appear the devi appears and says what can i do for you so here through meditation when the congregation the whole congregation sits in meditation the devta realizes that there is a need of us to the congregation and they come so here devta comes and then the devta say, the devi comes and says what can i i do for you and then the guru acharya bhadrava swami says well can you take shri uh, uh, yaksha sadhvi to simandar swami and get her um convince about like i mean can you take take her to simander song and through devta which means the devta in the vehicle carried her to the uh, mahavidya kshetra she communicated with simander song she got an opportunity to be there she gave, got back her answer and of course she was not uh, to be blamed for what happened she also got some other material uh, from there as a part of the scriptures and she returns back so here sometimes if you um, think no no i need to get direct communication this is yet another way you can the congregation sits into meditation and the devta comes in intervenes or helps out to uh, perform i mean to make the communication happen now in this context there is one power which is called ahara kilabdhi where you think oh i don't need the help of others i should be self sufficient to doing it you know that's our phrase i should be an expert of doing it and there there is a power called ahara klabdhi ahara klabdhi is a labdhi which is a rare power it's not a power which anyone could have it or uh, it is a power which would only a monk can have it and as per the shvetamba tradition only a 14 pur a purvadhar monk can have it 14 purvi jo monk hai only that person can have what is chauda purvi uh, anyone can anyone is familiar with chauda purvi you have seen chauda purvi you know you heard about it yes i okay good at least you have heard about it so what did you hear about it or directly when you hear about it <laughs> you heard in the song <laughs> not yeah. even good they are the you know complete uh, uh, i mean all ragams come from there or oh, the the complete knowledge exactly yes so uh, in you know there there are songs which we sing where it says if you say now kar mantra now kar mantra is the essence of 14 purvas so you might not read the whole big chunk of scriptures but if you just say the now kar mantra even then you're getting the essence of it so in a way it's uh, i mean to appreciate the now kar mantra that's the way it's been said and it is of course a universal mantra because in nakar mantra we are praying to arhant the enlightened beings the liberated beings the monks and nuns without any uh, name tag behind it like not specifying which bhagwan or which monk any person any soul in any robe if has the uh, status of enlightenment or uh, is a monk by heart by soul then actually the prayers to them so without any kind of external discrimination uh, nakar mantra is a universal prayer which 
where we pray to every spiritual soul. So here, when we talk about uh, Chauda Purva, is a big uh, canonical um, or scriptural package, and in a in a way, a person, an enlightened being, has the capacity to convey the knowledge. Right? How much is one knows, can one convey the whole of it? So, putting it in a different way, how much is the knowledge in this world? Knowledge treasure kitna hai? It's ocean, mm -hmm. right? I mean, knowledge, it's abundant, it's huge, it's, it's, I mean, even in, they give the example that if the water from the ocean is made into ink, and we start writing knowledge, and all the trees of the world are made into pen to write the knowledge, even then, knowledge is more than one could write by using all the water on all the trees in the world. I mean, of course, knowledge is abundant and knowledge of different areas. I mean, different fields, there are different kinds of knowledge which is there. So in, in, in fact, the, as knowledge is abundant, the enlightened being has an abundance of knowledge, but is not able to convey everything in its, uh, but even what of, an enlightened being can convey in one's life and what one can receive, that is 14 Purvas. So it's a mag... Huh? Can I, don't they have a Google then? <laughs> <laughs> they have the Google, but see, but we are not, we are not able to access their Google. That is our problem. <laughs> we wish we could have it access to that. They have their own type of Google. <laughs> Because, you will see, this is interesting. When we say that one has 14 Purva knowledge, then all the labdis, the powers, they're not trying to achieve it. They automatically have it within the package of that 14 Purva. Like, for example, Sthuli Bhadra had this, uh, they were, he was uh, learning the Purva knowledge, and he automatically got the power of Vaikriya. Or uh, a person who has Ahara Club, the Aha 14 Purvas can achieve. Uh, get the ahara kalabdi. So the ability to uh, tap into subtle powers and other things comes automatically with this uh, corpus of, I mean, exploration of knowledge in itself. So here, a 14 purvi person uh, might have this ahara kalabdi and use it. And sometimes, you know, there is a situation being stated. You ask a question to the monk, and the monk thinks, oh, I don't know the answer. What do I do? And he, say, he thinks, oh, I should make sure that the answer is being conveyed. I mean, I cannot just say, I don't know. It doesn't look nice. What do I do? You cannot create a fake answer. And then he thinks, let me use my power, create a heart body, a new body, and send it to Bhagawan. And through astral travel, actually, the body is created in nanoseconds. The body travels to Bhagawan. The body receives the answer and comes back. And within a even a blink, uh, the answer is being ready for you to be, I mean, listen. So it's a, such a fast process, and it happens because of this Ahara Club thing. So in this, what actually is happening is, the monk is sitting here, is in, like, you know, sometimes you sit with closed eyes, you think for a moment. So the monk is here, he's physically, he's uh, fully present here, but he creates a new subtle body through his power, and with that uh, power, he partially sends his soul out, travels into the space, communicates with the jina, comes back with the answer, and the answer is ready. So Ahara Klabdi usually is talked about to uh, get, um, is used to release a doubt or help oneself uh, clarify any uh, theoretical, philosophical issues they have in mind. So suppose uh, there are some kind of philosophical issues where by not having clarity on that, one might say their ascetic life is jeopardized. So as simple as this, suppose we say that plants have life and then someone gets a doubt about it, uh, that plants have life. And whether the plants have life or not, becomes a tri uh, it's a, it's it might seem trivial but it, it becomes a big crucial problem because if it has life then you for non-violence purpose you wouldn't hurt them right so for ascetic life to understand the uh, truth of practice i mean the practical aspect or the details of your um, ethics 
is crucial to your ascetic practice. And if there is a, a monk who gets troubled or gets um, is not clear about it or gets a doubt in your mind that whether it is this is right or that is right, and at that point one could actually use this Ahara Klavdi to send it out to get the answers clarified. In this context, there is a, uh, another situation. So suppose a person has this power and you know sometimes you get a, a new um, gadget and what do you want to make sure first? Does it work, right? First thing you want to make sure that sometimes the product could be um, flawed or it, there could be a flaw in the product or some other issue in the product so you want to make sure that it works properly, isn't it? So there could be a possibility that the mom gets excited and sees, oh, I have a Ahara Club D. I should try and test and see, does it work? And for that excitement, one could use Ahara Club D and send it to the tea center and get the darshan of tea center and come back. Now, is it okay to use it in the excitement? No. Okay, do you all agree with that? Okay. Yes. Huh? I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be in the same zone. <laughs> Suppose we, uh, a person, a monk has a doubt and then they use the labdi. Is that okay? Yes. Yes, that's right. Sure? No, I mean, doubt as to... Uh, uh, <coughs> as to doubt to che. Doubt, but as to an, an ethical question. I mean, not, not you know, anything. Really. Okay, even ethical question. You say yes. You give the permission then. Anyone else with Bharat Bhai? Kar sakte ji, nahi karna ji. Anyone who said no? Me. Why? Mm -hmm. Because is, if there is no need, if, if there is a need, then mm -hmm. we can do it. That's what. So no, that's what they are saying. Yeah. But he, you said it's excitement. It is no, no. I'm trying to say if, if there is a testing it. No, so even if, if there is a doubt. Oh, there is a doubt. Mm. Mm. So yes. Even the concept of a Kirtan Church, you explained earlier that a Kavali has all the powers or has all the knowledge, they decide not to spread it, whereas a Kirtan Church decides to spread it. Therefore, mm -hmm. I see that if you have a doubt, then yes, you should connect to the Kirtan Church because that's his um, vision to, to deliver the messages. Yeah. The whole thing is delivered. Now, one thing I'll clarify here um, about Kavali, it's not that they don't want to spread the knowledge. They would not make a big initiative of creating a big empire like Jainism. They might, like for example, if you have a question and you go to a Kavali, they would answer to it. If there are people around, they would talk to them and give them the discourse or help them. But it wouldn't be an, uh, a big initiative of establishing a congregation. So they wouldn't do a big business. They would be a simple, whatever comes into their way, they would make an effort to help people or do it, but not like in a formalized congregational setup. It would be just informal, like making things happen. Now, when we talk about uh, Deep Center has the capacity or the knowledge, and we can get the answer to this, but again, going back to our previous lectures, we also had mentioned that Labdhi should not be used, right? You remember that? Labdhi is actually a power. So according to any tradition in India, we, we, we would say that anyone should, one should not use supernatural powers for the most purposes, I mean, it, it's denied. Because the moment you tap into the supernatural powers and you use it, you get excited about it, then there is a fame and name component in it, and then you get detracted from the original path of spirituality which you really have. So not going into magic and mystical aspects of uh, accomplishments, you should just focus on your spiritual aspect. And in this context, yes, even if you have doubt, using labdhi is unethical. It's not right, to, it, it's prohibited basically. I mean, um, of course, all Indian traditions would say this, and at some occasions there are exceptions being mentioned here and there in all traditions, but, uh, you go by the original core uh, concept, no matter, no matter what kind of power you have, 
and no matter what kind of situation you go through, you know, sh you should not be using those powers. Now, one example I think we mentioned in our last session was Tejas Labdi. In front of Bhagwan Mahavir, there are two monks who were pushed, put into ashes by Tejas Labdi, if you remember that. But Bhagwan did not use Labdi to stop that process. He could have done it. So even Bhagwan did not use power, supernatural power or other powers to help his own monks and nuns at that point of big chaos. He said not to use power. So again, there are uh, different uh, thought process which will go into that, not going into those details, but the key thing is even Ahara Club, the person does, and if doesn't take Christship, if doesn't go to atonement, then there is, uh, it, their ascetic life is tainted. It is it is spot on the cloth, like, you know, it, it's not right. One should purify themselves before uh, to make sure that they don't carry that. Uh, the price sheet or the atonement could be a small one, it need not be a big one, but still, if you don't go through that, you actually, um, you have a flaw in your practice, basically. And the, uh, the way we say it is that uh, in scriptures it mentions, suppose a person does the Ahara Club B and uh, returning back, they might uh, not take go through the atonement and pass off, they die there. So in that state, one dies with their uh, ascetic life not, um, I mean, their ascetic code was not, they don't, they didn't go through the purification process before um, dying. So it's not considered to be, it's called viradhak. Aradhak and viradhak are two terms. Aradhak means to practice your committed thing in a, in a best way, and viradhak means to have uh, flawed, I mean, a flaw in your practice or a taint in your practice, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a mistake in your practice. So being viradhak is not good because you've made such a big commitment to your spiritual life. You've left your home, home, you've left your worldly materials, you've put your hours and hours into penance, tapasya to grow in your spirituality and then if you're not able to make sure that you do it fully right, you're actually going with the spot on your uh, mark on your uh, negative mark on your uh, aesthetic life. So it's rec it's considered that it's very important that one goes through a, a purification of any kind of small and big mistakes. And that's why I think we also have the pollution very important. I mean, the whole year there are different occasions we, we go through different kinds of things. It could be good, bad, happy moments, sad moments, complaints, fights, disputes, right? So can we make it a point that at the end of the year, we actually have a deep clean of our inner self? I mean, we do make sure that deep cleaning is important of the house, isn't it? I'm not sure. Do we do deep cleaning here in London? Like fam uh, house got deep cleanings like that? Spring cleaning. Hmm? Spring. Yeah, spring cleaning. Achha, because in I mean, US, I think we didn't do a deep cleaning. Yeah, so... You, you do deep cleaning when you buy the house? Achha. And when you sell the house. <laughs> <laughs> and in between, whether you use it for 10 years or 50 years, it's no matter. I do spring <laughs> So yeah, here same case in the Jainism, we don't wait for selling the house. We don't say the last moment. We could do it every year. <laughs> Pratik, uh, the pollution is a moment to make sure that you uh, go through any kind of um, forgiveness and prashit of any small and big mistakes one could have done in the whole year. So. Purification has been important in uh, ascetic life and here when using Ahara Club B, it's considered to be going against the ethics. So you could see here, it's so crucial, seeing the Jina or the Tirthankar should be such a blessed moment, isn't it? Even visiting temple, people are so um, excited and uh, into that peaceful energy and visualizing the real Tirthankar would be such a big blessing of life. But even that, or even the, um, uh, even getting the questions resolved, because that is so important for the person who is practicing ascetic life. Yet, uh, using labdi is not allowed. It's it's prohibited. It's, it's said no. Yes, I get confused in this concept in the sense that in meditation we are tr actually trying to do that. We are trying to say restrict uh, mm. Bhagwan and. And then here we said, don't use it. 
So I'm getting confused. Very, very nice, sir. Good question. So basically, when we talk about meditation, we are trying to not use special powers in the sense that we use uh, um, supernatural power. It's not about supernatural power. It is about about your with your stillness and with your um, state of purity, you are able to reach or communicate to the other world. So there are meditations which we also guide as to um, travel in the meditation. There is certain meditations where we try to travel through. Um, I mean, there is a concept which we uh, use in meditation, but it is not about, I mean, the basic key difference is not, it's not about supernatural power. It is about your uh, purity, it's your stillness, it's your meditative state, which makes, gives you an opportunity to tap into or reach to the other uh, end of the world, basically. So it's not, it's not, um, it's two different methods, basically. One is very different, the other one's okay. Yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the whole idea is um, labdi. Labdi is uh, power and uh, using power is not okay. Now I'm giving, going back to a very subtle concept. I think um, there's a question being asked when you create a subtle, because here you see you're creating a new body in labdi. You, you don't send the same, you're, I mean, how do you travel? You're not sending this body. So what is going is a new body, and what is that body? It is actually, um, the size it is cubit height, and it is a crystal form, it is very beautiful, it is small, and it could travel to any doors, windows, mountains, anything which comes in between, nothing can stop it, and it is um, it travels very fast. So that new body is traveling, of course, you are the soul there traveling in the new body, but it is uh, a new vehicle which you have created to travel to the other end. And when you use this new vehicle, there, this travel actually, there's a question being asked, would you hurt certain certain uh, microbes in your travel in the process? And the answer is yes. So even the body it is so um, subtle, it is in the crystal form and it is subtle and it cannot, uh, it doesn't get obstructed and it doesn't obstruct others. I mean, the, for ahara especially, it is said that it, it doesn't uh, get stopped by anyone and it doesn't stop. So if anyone passes through the ahara, they would not get stopped by the ahara body as well. So yet, even with, though it is so subtle, the possibility of violence is yes. So I think even because of the violence, the concept of violence involved in it, the concept of using labdi is not okay, uh, there would be a denial to this process. But meditation, actually what we do is we are not using supernatural powers, we are not new, creating new bodies, we are just using the, um, our, we are unveiling our conscious power and using, the, of course, the Tejas body and Karmic body is with us, but we are trying to do the travel without that additional gadget. Now, there is still a question for me, uh, which I or which one could uh, ask is, would there be samudgat involved in the meditational method of going to the Bhagwan? No, I think a thought is a, hmm? a thought is a, uh, is a, is kind of, has fulfilled it. So, it must, it is like a body. Thought is a putgal, but it it's not, thought need not have soul in it. Fine, but the, so samudgat is about the soul traveling outside the body. Yeah. So does the soul leave the body partially in this meditative state? Is it possible? Yeah, some more answer. Anyone uh, have, might have heard or uh, experienced levitation, right? You know, yeah. that the person was floating up uh, outside the body through meditation. So these levitational experiences could seem to be samudgat. What's interesting here is that we do have one type of uh, tejas samudgat. It's called anisaranatmak tejas samudgat. So we have different kinds of subtle bodies. One is tejas body. Now tejas body is a bioelectric body. It's a, a body of radiant energy body which we have. So for example, your digestion power is because your radiant personality is because of your subtle body in you. 
and the concept of subtle body is uh, there in all tradition and the concept of tejas is also there in all tradition but again they would have their own uh, uh, different approaches to explaining it but uh, when we talk about traveling in the meditative state the probability is that you just travel as a soul and there is only the tejas body uh, and the karmic body traveling with the, the soul so this is a special projection of samudhas which is not creating something new but expansion of the soul to a new destination will there be violence involved in it or not and then these are questions which we don't know any uh, we don't know any specific answer to it yet because things are not written about it in that way but uh, yeah these are i mean the other thing is that uh, if one could for kevli samudha one does kevli samudha then releases the karmic energy so one does samudha to release the karma why can't one do samudha to release the karmas even before enlightenment state so in kevli samudha one a kevli an enlightened being actually projects outside the soul outside the body just to discard the karma i mean even that's possible and why can't a, a non enlightened being do the samudha to discard their karmas we have people who say that they do a meditation which they choose to project out to discard the karma now we have people saying about it but in philosophy and text we don't have a mention about these things here as well yeah so any other questions please and then maybe three or two or three questions first question is when you started the topic when you when we say namo arihantanam mm. does it only refer to tirthankars or tirthankars and kevalis only tirthankars so not so when we we are not buying down to the the in kevalis in namo arihantanam no not in namo arihantanam they will all be in sadhus actually in sadhus sadhu category is actually very a vast category even the ascetic category is a huge category and all kevalis also belong to the sadhu category why do you know So now, we, for example, we would say in the morning time uh, we are praying to Sri Mandir Swami, but we could also pray to Mahavir Swami in the, his past state mm -hmm. as a Tirthankar he was. Now he is a Siddha, but in his past state, what he was, uh, we we could think about him in his that form. But usually, it is the whatever time they were, they were Tirthankars earlier. So in their earlier Tirthankar state, we would bow down to them. in that form then so on that basis when we say we bow down to krishna the hindus bow, so we we can bow down to krishna because in the future he is going to become a tirthankar now yes there are uh, some um, scriptures or poems or uh, compositions in which we talk about uh, expressing our reverence to the tirthankars or enlightened souls of all three times and yes so it there that state which would come about in that time and they would have got into that purity and that enlightened state yes that i mean there are some compositions which we do see that there is a but <coughs> the whole idea is you have to we are taking into account that time that that status of their soul okay. to do that the second question is in the concept of samudgat we believe the soul is either in one place or another place that's mm -hmm. a general belief of a soul that mm -hmm. when we die then our soul will leave here and go into another place but in the concept of samudgat and the way you describe the arak samudgat the concept is the soul can be here and the soul can be there wherever it there is simultaneously so the soul is in two locations yes. separate locations at the same time yes very good point so basically the po the whole idea of samudgat is this that the So we, uh, the way we say is we we have an elastic, right? And if you have an elastic, and you can pull it, you can stretch it. It can go to for some degree, we can stretch it up. Mm -hmm. Similarly, here the soul has the capacity to stretch and squeeze. So, for example, a soul dies and becomes uh, an ant's soul. Be dies and becomes an elephant in the next life. So, the soul was this big, right? Like an ant size. And what happened to its size? elephant size so it could expand so one property of the soul of J in jainism is that the soul can expand and squeeze so we have to keep that in mind and now when we say that we can expand and squeeze in different lives depending on what kind of body we had so this body we think oh i'm uh, short or tall or i'm slim or fat we identify ourselves with this body right 
but this is just a shell which you have it for a few decades you've had it, few more decades you will have it, and after that what? You would change it, your form would change it, and so the cycle is going on. Now, with this expansion and contraction that happens at the time of birth to get fit into the new body, but can that happen even now? Now, where is the soul? It's confined within the skin. I mean, outside the skin, you wouldn't feel the, if I have to feel anything, my knowing power is confined to the skin, right? This body thing. So it is in the living state, in the uh, current state, the soul has the ability to expand itself outside the skin layer and travel to a distant place. So samudghat is a concept where the soul is partially inside, partially stretched out, but it's not disconnected. So the stretching out is still connected with the old body. So it's an expansion, it's with, uh, the connection is maintained and uh, part of myself actually is in different land and they would do the different thing and come back and we, I, get, I contract back myself, I retrieve back myself. Yeah. And the last question is, you see, if I'm, a, if I'm a doctor, I've got the power to heal people or to, to that. So the concept of saying that if I, then what's the utility of having Aharak Samudgar if it's prohibited to be used so if I want to fly, I know I don't have wings to fly. So, so nature has given me this ability that even though if I want to fly, I cannot fly because I don't have the wings. Mm. So then if nature has endowed me with or, or the possibility of having Aharak Samudgar, and if I can't use it, then what's a, what's, a pro, mm. what's a purpose and utility that even a monk, not for their own self-interest, but even for the in interest of the congregation, that if I can't use this power of potential, then what's, what's the utility of, of, of Aharak Samudgar in the first place? Okay, well, excellent. So basically, one, one thing you should think, I think uh, in, uh, in religious uh, accomplishments, the journey of uh, accomplishment which we think of in the external world is, okay, if you have the skill, you use it, you use it for the better of the community or the society, and you, you go grow from there. So you're contributing there. In spiritual, this thing, what is your ultimate purpose? Purification. Hmm? Being yeah. selfish, you're not helping anyone. <laughs> 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 so we allow Bansi, you can use our Hara Kalavati Bansi. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I have a philosophical issue with, with this whole aspect that if you're not helping others, even if you're a soul, you should be helping. And this concept of not helping others mm. disturbs me. Okay. Mm. It's not about not helping, and I think we should correct that. Yeah. It's not about not helping, it's about don't engage yourself into supernatural powers. It's very simple theory. So in the process of engaging, in, for example, someone asks me a question and I don't, I would use the power. Why would I use the power? Because I feel that, oh, I, I'm so knowledgeable, how can I not answer the question? There is an ego complex within me. So, I'll give you one another reminder example, Stuli Bhadra, right? Such a learned monk, he's gone through like 10 purvas of knowledge through rigorous practice. And when he, their sister, his sister visited him, what did he think? How will my sister know that I have so much of knowledge? I should express it. And how did he express it? He became a lion to show that he has some powers where he could change himself. So even such a learned monk who is the most disciplined, who is most capable at that time because all other were dropouts except him. Even with that situation, he has this ego thing that how will my sisters know about my knowledge and I knew should, I should use my power. So the, the ego and uh, the greed and all these are very subtle components which, uh, which, which can take away easily, I mean, in supernatural powers and stuff. So basically with that emphasis that these are powers and one should not use it is being um, emphasized a lot. And it's not about not helping others, it's about um, not getting swayed up into those extra things which is coming up. And as Rajiv may ask, if we don't, if we have it and we don't use it, what's the use of it? So when we have it, we're not having it because we wanted it or we, because that was our purpose. So for example, if you have a degree of becoming a doctor, and in the process of becoming a doctor, you might get some additional uh, certifications, 
what would you choose? You would choose to be a profession by a doctor or some other petty things around. If you got a main accomplishment, so for example, if you have, suppose you have a business, you, you, you have your own product which you've come up with and you want to sell that product, but just for um, business purpose, you have a strategy where you have other um, products of other people, you're also selling that. What would you choose to marketize and emphasize your key business of your product or other gadget which you're just having to, as a supplementary thing? Yeah. And suppose you think you see that your product is not getting out as much as you're wasting time in selling others' products, what, do you, what would you do? You would bring in awareness, no, I need to focus on this, isn't it? This is the same thing here in spirituality. Our focus is our spiritual growth. And towards that, we need to keep track of that. And in that, these supernatural powers comes in our way towards um, our growth. And that's the reason we say that make sure that you don't uh, get swayed away. Like, for example, there are other men, uh, reasons mentioned in the Ahara Club. The one would just use power to see, oh, do I have power? You know, that excitement, does it work? How does it feel like if I have this power, if I travel, what will be feeling? To go and uh, have it or someone would say oh the jinnah the tirthankar is just born i want to see the baby jinnah but Vandami, hmm. don't scriptures have also uh, illustrations of monks using their power so for example gautam swami hmm. Amruta was say, so with hmm. this he hmm. fed so many monks so don't we have illustrations of monks actually using the labdi for the betterment of others and, and not as a, as a bad yes so uh, there is this uh, we are not i mean I would say I'm not very uh, clear on this concept, but we see that Gautam Swami used um, one labdi where he could actually uh, climb the mountain with a spiral, spiral prayer, and because of his ability and his doing that, he was able to, like, because more other uh, rishis, they saw this person climbing the mountain with the help of just a spider's web thread. It was amazing to them and that amazing scene actually motivated the other um, rishis to get uh, becoming a monk and uh, move forward with Bhagavan Mahavi. So we find this power has been used by Gautam Swami, whether it is uh, these kinds of powers, but we, we're not sure as to wh what kind of powers were okay and what were not okay and whether even if he used it, did he take prashit or was that power to be uh, was in the realm of okay I mean so it, it, these are questions which we don't have any clear answer to it but uh, it's it's uh, we, we do find I mean we do find uh, there are see the other thing is in history we see that there are some monks who have used powers when there was uh, uh, trouble time so they would use the power to say pro for the protection of the congregation but then they would just do the price at the end of the day. So in a way, what we are trying to see is that uh, there is, even one uses for some purpose of the congregation or for any um, self-help purpose, uh, at the end there is a price and one just make sure that you take the price so that you don't die without, with all the petty things attached to you. What I misuse the powers even if you use it the reason there is a misuse possibility too much involved in it so literally it's been prohibited but even so when we say use it for uh, a good reason even then the price component is there yes. one thing. so what's the difference between aharak samudkat and say for example we say samyak darshan intuition hmm. so you could actually be sitting here getting the clarification and you get so intuition so what's the difference between that because intuition means that you could perhaps get a, a resolution to your query so it's a, it could be a complex query the guru maharaj could be sitting in meditation and mm. getting some in, intuition now this is uh, where we see that there is a distinction between cognitive power <coughs> and metaphysical power like ability so for example a person in meditation or in dream state you, you visualize something uh, some answers come to you you can some people have this precognition ability, right? They can see things what's going to happen. They, they're able to perceive uh, things happening or they could also 
uh, communicate telepathy, right? You know, you, you, you are thinking something, you send them a message and the other person says, oh, exactly this is what I was thinking. So you, there is a ability of telepathy or uh, uh, cognition or knowing things, uh, 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 getting the answers through the ability of knowledge. So we have one example is Avdhi Gyan. What is Avdhi Gyan? The ability to know? The past <coughs> yeah. So Avdhi Gyan is a cognitive ability. You're sitting here and you have Avdhi Gyan and you can see the lands, other lands, or you could actually see uh, other times. You can travel in time and space through your knowing power. You're not physically in that land. You're not physically traveling into past or future or distant lands. But by your, it's like a television, right? The, there is a satellite out there and you have, you're sitting here and you know what's going on around in the world. So there is some uh, calamity, some uh, Olympic games, no matter what's go happening anywhere, you're still able to see and visualize it at the same moment, almost same moment and then like close to it. So that is, through this external gadgets, we are able to visualize it. You're not traveling to that land, but you're still able to see it. So same, here there is a satellite or a setup outside, a technological setup is outside. Same can happen in your inside. So there could be a cognitive ability of the jnana, some special knowing power which you can, like the intuition power, and that can help you see distant lands or distant scenes. So you don't even need the technology, the science part of the technology to uh, reach to the other land you could still visualize things through your conscious power. So here, the ability is to see, it's not the ability to um, reach to that place. And there are some other abilities where you can actually be here and you can also communicate, it's not the seeing. So one example is like, uh, for example, a devta has a question and he says, okay, I have a question, I don't like to travel so far, I want to send my question to Bhagwan. So he thinks of the question, and Bhagwan is Kevalyan, so he receives the question, and then Bhagwan actually answers it mentally, but since Avdhi Gyani, he has the power to read the other's mind from a distance, it's a cognitive ability. And so he receives the answer by observing the thought process of Bhagwan. You said, like earlier we were talking about the communication, right, one-way traffic, and we are helpless to not receive the other end. But here, through Avdhi Gyan, one can also receive the message from the other end. And without traveling, there could be a communication back and forth, um, answering and receiving the answer. So a person need not use Ahar for Avdhi. And using this communication ability or the Avdhi Gyan is not prohibited. It's, it's ethical, it's, it's uh, um, within the, because it is your natural capacity. Cognitive ability is the ability of the soul. Supernatural power is an ability which we tap into by tapping into material aspect of the world. So you tap into, uh, you use matter to uh, create something and then travel. So it's not a natural, it is a supernatural power but cognition is a natural power and you could use that to communicate and get the answers from there. So, just to follow up on that, you're saying that cognitive ability is a natural power, whereas the other one's Super. supernatural. And, but the concept here is that, how do we know what is natural and what is not natural? <laughs> <laughs> you should get it then. <laughs> See, I'm not using any external gadgets, then it is natural. If I'm using external gadgets or ex any other um, tools or any other material things, then it is outside my range, isn't it? If you're, for example, if you're thinking and you're answering to my questions, or if you're thinking and creating questions, it is your natural ability, right? Because you're not seeing, you're not going into Google search, you're not uh, trying to uh, take any other external uh, tools as a, as a source of your communication. You're just, it's an inner process which you're doing it. But in supernatural power, you're trying to pick some energy from the outside. There is a process of actually how you do it also. So you project out to receive the raw material. So if you need to construct a, a crystal kind of body, new body, the soul, projects out in the pillar form 
receives the subtle matter from the space, comes back and processes that matter, creates the new body and then sends the body. So there is an engagement into you tapping into material power, uh, shaping it into the, your exact form which you like it or which is needed and then sending it out. So this whole thing actually makes it supernatural power. But um, it, it's a little deep track, but again, I'll, the word lavdi is there in uh, scriptures and the word lavdi usually is used to uh, denote um, supernatural power. In the list of lavdis, we have aharak lavdi, vekya lavdi, tejas lavdi, and different kinds of lavdis. And we also have keval gyan listed in that. So it is um, a natural power, but uh, accomplished to the complete height, it's put into the category of supernatural because it is supernatural for us in a way. You, you get the idea? The problem? So the problem, I mean, the concept of lavdi is uh, not very uh, well uh, documented in uh, scriptures. It is um, jumbled up a little bit. It is, it, it has gone through different stages of development of ideas in the way it has been depicted. Um, so again, I forget about what I said. So <laughs> it would get created more from, <laughs> from those years. Uh, lavdi and uh, samudra, how? How are the two interlinked? Can one exist even without the other? Ah, yes. Very good question. So there are three labdi, three samudras which don't uh, need labdi. That is very clear. Uh, the Vedani samudra, the, the soul is an intense pain one projects out, intense emotion one projects out, and during death. So people like in your death, they start talking about near death experience or walking into the tunnel or uh, reaching to the birthplace or I mean, those things, it is not, there is no labdi involved in it. Even in Kevali Samudra, there is no labdi. It is all spontaneous process, which is just happening. But in Tejas Samudra, Vekya Samudra, and Aharak Samudra, these are three Samudra, the three projections where there is a special power, special effort being made to go through this uh, Samudra. Yeah. What's the difference between labdi and nidhi? No, 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 Nidhi, I think it's the uh, Pant Parmeshti mm. and the four uh, Grand Dashtam Charit uh, Samudra. So that That's is called Nau Nidhi? Uh, I Nau Pad, no, that is Nau Pad, no? Uh, Nau Pad is this, uh, but Nau Nidhi... Oh, yeah, Gujarat, I say Nau Pad is Nau Nidhi, you have to... So, ah, so then it is some power. Maybe it will be some sort of treasure, isn't it? Yeah, yeah treasure. Yeah, then that's yeah. power. So that, then these are all associated with so, treasure. So any concluding uh, comment or concluding question? <laughs> we can go open to anything. Uh, in, uh, in physics, like uh, Tamiji, uh, usually what happens is while there are multiple philosophies, so for example, there's gravitational and then there's you know quantum and then something. But then in the end, they say that there would be one unifying theory. Yes. You know, which would call sort of unify mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. So actually when you talk about this samudra, then actually it is very similar to some other things. Uh, so for example, you talked about, about Tejas samudra last time and it was very similar to um, the Karm theory. And for example, you talked about Aharak and it's very similar to again cognitive powers. Maybe at certain level they go and combine, the way you're saying, you know. Okay, so uh, putting in different, uh, different is there a unifying theory about samudra in a way, right? Yeah, samudra and the cognitive powers, for example, you know. Okay, Le there are two things. One is there are certain things which we are able to do through samudra, we could do it without samudra. Mm -hmm. So that is just the cognitive abilities. Uh, one thing which we conclude, I mean, like overall in the context of samudra, it is the ability of the soul, one thing, and the ability to expand and squeeze, that's crucial about it. Second thing 
is all projections are you are happening with the help of matter so it's there is a soul matter uh, dual engage i mean interaction of soul and matter soul and karma soul and matter or if you put it in a more explicit manner some some of that involves soul karma and matter and some would be involves just soul and karma so there is a soul and non soul jeev and ajeev component which interacts in its most uh, subtle manner to either accomplish a task or uh, which is given by the karmic force or accomplish a desired task of your own uh, desires or emotions basically yeah. but it it we would see parallels of samudgat and non samudgat that's another question which comes up that what are the powers where samudgat is involved and what is what samudgat is not involved like the meditation we were talking about that i might travel to simandar swami through meditation but am i traveling physically I mean, is it just my mental construction or is it a real soul is expansion to that place it's hard to say whether this is happening or not because it's all so subtle sometimes people say that oh i went but they might have just had the experience of at the at the unconscious level but you might end up saying oh i went and one uh, good example for this is people who have um, out of body experience or at night in sleep they feel the um, they are um, there is a, in i'm not remembering the name but in sleep state people have a feeling of a jerk or feeling of shakiness and they feel that they are just pushed out uh, or some uh, blocked up in the sleep or something like they sleep would have paralysis. one time huh? sleep paralysis yes so they might have it one time that experience but students have reported that the experience actually happened once but after that they could still Uh, many nights they would feel that they are having it just because uh, they had it in their unconscious mind that oh this can happen and this might happen and this happens right so the later times it's not really happening it just um, the kind of, yeah so similarly here even in con- context of meditational travel or uh, sometimes the person would really have it but the other occasions it could be just the feeling uh, at the unconscious mind but it need not be Case. So it's hard to distinguish whether one is going through a samudhat or not, especially in other cases. I mean, labdis we are very sure that labdis using labdis there is this process going and one is engaged into. But in other cases, um, it's not easy to say because there is one another concept which comes up here is because uh, that there is a, we talk about spirit position, right? Spirit position is a common concept. and in scriptures it mentions that if if a person is or a monk or nun is being possessed by spirit how could it happen so they mentioned two possibilities one the spirit could really enter to the body the other possibility is the spirit doesn't enter into the body it is just they send that energy one specific energy into the uh, other's body and then the, they control the body so here we see that the the spirit is not going through uh, a process of entering into the body or samudhat or expansion they are there where they are they only regulated by some additional energy which they choose or use to work it out so there are theories which support this cons uh, this fact that the probability of samudgat happening always may not be the case there could be other occasions similar to spinning of samudgat but may not be samudgat yeah so just one question comes along in like in <coughs> physics you can either have an on state or an off state either the light is on or off mm-hmm. but like in quantum physics you can actually have multiple states at the same time so either it could be on and off at the sa- same same mm-hmm. time so in like for example in maran maran samudga is could it be possible that in one place you are dead other place you are feeling that you are actually being born there so is is it a state whereby yes i am dead and i'm born at at, at the same point in time or there's because general concept says one is dead here and then you are born somewhere else by having that state that maran samud got i'm feeling that i'm dead here the life the body is lifeless and yet at the same time i'm getting that idea that i'm going to be born here so i'm actually born in this new place here so could you have that both birth and death simultaneous yes very good question it actually can happen but again it is very subtle concept so uh, so what happens is one is uh, time is up but i'm taking yeah, yeah. with your permission <laughs> 
So there is a situation where the soul is here and expands to the new birthplace. So is here and expanded to the next destination. It's everywhere in between as well. You have to remember that. Okay. Now, when the death actually occurs here in this place, which means the soul uh, had expanded from here to there, it, it starts squeezing up towards the birthplace because it's stretched. And then when the death happens here, the birth process can start there. So death and birth is happening at the same time, same moment, and the soul is expanded. So the retrieving process is also happening at the same time. So the, the time when the death occurs, birth occurs, the retrieving process starts off, the soul is not completely retrieved to the new place. It is stretched up and the birth has started up. So the interesting part is when you say, do I know that I'm here, I'm dying, I'm being born? Actually, people would not have such a detailed awareness of death itself many times, right? People are walking and dying and talking and dying. You've seen that. So that awareness that I'm dying and I'm being born, usually it need not be the case they have it to, because it is such a subtle moment of time which is happening that you don't have the real awareness of it. So uh, you would not consciously know that's happening, but it can happen, yeah. And uh, there's where it's, it, it's, the whole process of death, death and birth becomes very tricky and very um, detailed because of this Marana Samutta concept. Okay, I think we should stop here. <laughs> so you do mangli? Yes. Stand up and can breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Namo arhantanam, namo siddhanam, namo ayayanam, namo vajjayanam, namo noe sauvasahunam, namo noe sauvasahunam, namo vajjayanam, namo ayayanam, Namo Siddhanam, Namo Arhantanam, Eso Panchanamukkaru, Sarva Pavapanasanam, Mangalanam, Tisavvesim, Padamang Havai Mangalam, Chattari Mangalam, Arhanta Mangalam, Siddha Mangalam, Sahu Mangalam, Kivali Pannattu Dhammo Mangalam, Chattari Loguttama, Arhanta Loguttama, Siddha Loguttama, Sahu Loguttama, Kivali Pannattu Dhammo Loguttama, Chattari Sarnam Pavachami Arhanti Sarnam Pavachami Siddhi Sarnam Pavachami Sahu Sarnam Pavachami Kevali Pannatan Dhammam Sarnam Pavachami Vigana Haran Mangal Karan Swam Bhikshuna Unam Guna Ola Pisumirana Kiya Sareya Chintyakam Angutheyam Ritavasi Labdhitana Bhanda Shri Guru Gautam Samari Manavanchit Kalidata, Manavanchit Kalidata. And thank you all for your wonderful uh, questions and interactions.